Welcome everyone. I'm Rebecca Grant. I'm a board member at ADAPT. Um, good morning. And let's hope it's not a too hot of a day today. Um, it's nice to see you all. And I'm just going to play the role of Jeannie Jensen today because she's out of the office. So um, I have a few slides to go through and then we'll hear from Tom Pressing on our local updates and then also on our presentation of the day, which is neighborhood first aid. So for those of you who were here last month, we talked about first aid in the household, first aid with your family. Um, and today we're bringing that into <coughs> what it looks like at the neighborhood level to help neighbors um, triage and treat people who are injured after a disaster. So that's going to be wonderful. Thank you, Tom, for for spearheading that today. Um, I will go ahead and start my screen share. Hopefully you can all see it. One moment. So um, just a quick reminder for those who um, are new to ADAPT or new to the meeting today, we are focused on disaster preparedness. We do training like today. Um, we have a resource library with all of the materials from past meetings, as well as some partner materials um, that we will refer to throughout the day. And so I'll try to put links in the chat as those things come up so you can get familiar if you're not already. Um, and we work closely with the town to do things like the emergency assembly points mm -hmm. and a lot of other great programs. We're volunteer based, founded in 1999. We partner with the Atherton Police Department and we have monthly community, me community meetings as well as many, many other programs that you'll hear about today. Um, this is our board. You, most of you probably know all of us, but I think most of us are on the call today. And um, we have, uh, we work closely with Atherton neighborhoods. They're numbered one to 14, which is how the Menlo Park Fire Protection District views the town. Um, so we really follow that model to make the integration more seamless. And in every area, we maintain the maps, we work with area coordinators to oversee that person-to-person -person connection. And um, we help set up and maintain emergency assembly points where people can gather after disasters. We also have evacuation routes on our website and you're all encouraged to work on those yourself as well. And the link at the bottom is the resource library. Um, today's, today's topic is neighborhood first aid. This is the fourth in the sequence that we've been working on the past few months. In April, we talked about personal and family disaster response. Then we talked about neighborhood disaster response. In June last month, we went into the medical side and looked at basic first aid, as I said. Today is the neighborhood first aid. So if you're sensing a pattern, yes, you are first, your family is second, and then your neighborhood is third. Um, and all of this information is based on real world disaster reports. We try to provide a plan of action. We're not just educating, we're motivating um, actual action after a disaster. And all of this is leading up to the emergency drill, which is September 11th. So all the skills that we're gaining competence and confidence in now will help us be ready for a disaster and will help us work through the drill. And I have to say, it also helps me in my personal family life as well to know how to follow these tactics. So with that, um, we'll have time for Q&A at the end if anyone wants to ask about ADAPT, but I'll go ahead and pass it over to Tom for local updates. And I'll yes. stop my share so we can see your face, Tom. Okay. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Commander Dan Larson, um, uh, who will be uh, our liaison for the next period of time uh, for the, with the, our uh, Athen, wonderful Atherton Police Department. Uh, Commander Dan, uh, do you have any updates from the chief and yourself to the community? Yeah, I actually, uh, I have a few on our list, but first I'd just like to say hello to everyone. It's nice to see you all again. I was able to attend a few ADAP meetings back when I was a sergeant, and then uh, I promoted in around January of this year to commander. And so I've been enjoying that and just trying to learn that new role. Uh, a little bit about me, I've been with Atherton for about nine years now. 
And then prior to that, I worked for the university police over at Cal State East Bay as a police officer. And I was also a police officer with the city of San Carlos before they were uh, taken over by the sheriff's office. So, but it's great to see, great to see everybody again. And thank you for having me. In terms of the police department, I'm sure everyone's noticed we've had an uptick in burglaries. And a, a few of the things, just so we're all on the same page that the police department is doing, we've actually, we've increased our patrols. We started doing burglary suppression details. And we've noticed for the majority of our burglaries, we are getting them either, it's either in the early kind of evening hours or the early morning hours. The early evening hours are gonna be more of our window smash, go into master bedroom kind of burglaries. And then the early morning hours are gonna be more of someone walking through town and they see a garage door open, they see a bicycle, something like that, and they're, they're taking bicycles. So some of the things that we've done to address these issues is we've started doing extra burglary suppression details. And what that is, is that's a proactive patrol where we bring in an extra officer. They're in uniform driving around in an unmarked car. And their goal is to just go out and find anything that they could find that might be suspicious and investigate that. Then we've also, we've put in extra patrols in the morning between 4.30 a.m. and 6 a.m. to try to curb a lot of those walking through town, finding things to steal kind of burglaries that we've been getting in those early hours. And so we're hoping those two things will also help curb that. Another thing I've done is I contacted the gang task force. They're on phase three of their summer deployment. And they're actually sending some of the gang task force officers to go patrol Atherton in the early evening hours as well to get just more, more people out on the road. We have two patrol cars that we use as decoy cars. And so we have those out and we put them out throughout town and we've been moving those every Wednesday and every Saturday. And that also helps us kind of bring up our presence and, and let someone know that there might be a police officer in the area. We've been communicating and coordinating with outside agencies. A lot of them are down south in the LA area. And this is regarding um, the, where did I put that? The South American gangs that have been coming in and, and committing some of these burglaries. And we've been doing a lot of information sharing. Uh, the issue that we're having is as soon as we're able to identify a suspect or, or get a good investigative lead, they are on a plane and they're going back to their, their country of origin. And then at that point, we can't prosecute them, unfortunately, because they're, they're no longer in the country and they're not going to extradite someone from a different country for a, a burglary call. But we've been doing a lot of coordination with them. And as part of that is we, we were able to locate where they were renting all their vehicles from. And we have place, we have this uh, system called the flock system, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with. And we were able to input all of the rental cars that they might use when they come out and commit these crimes into the flock system. So anytime one of those cars comes through the town of Atherton, the camera alerts, it sends a notification to dispatch, it sends a notification to the officers, and then they go out and they flood that area trying to find that vehicle. And we're, we're hoping a lot of these things are gonna help curb some of the crime that we've been coming in contact with. Uh, another project I've been working on is we're looking into getting a GPS tracker. I, that started this week and I'm working on trying to find one that's gonna be appropriate for all of our needs. And then once we get that, what it would do is we could hide it in a bicycle, we could hide it in a package, and then we would probably reach out to some of our residents and say, hey, We've got this bicycle, can we put it on your property? And then we put it out there, it's motion activated. And so as soon as someone comes and moves it or takes it, it starts sending messages to dispatch and all the officers of that it's been moved and it'll give us the actual location of where it's going because it's gonna have a cellular service to it. So we're hoping to get that out shortly. We also offer our SEPTED assessments, which is crime prevention through environmental design. And what with that is, is we sent multiple officers to a training and they will come out to your home and they will review your property with you and give you tips and all these things about how to keep yourself safe, how to harden your defenses and that kind of stuff. I sent out a burglary news flash uh, most recently, which went out with just some overall burglary tips. I believe I sent that out yesterday. And then lastly, our detectives, uh, the San Jose Police Department, recently did a big bicycle sting regarding high-end bicycles and they recovered a lot of these bicycles so we've sent them a list of all of our stolen bicycles to hopefully see if we could get matches on that which might help us develop suspects in some of our crimes and then 
Some other news from the PD is our new building is almost here and we're very excited about that. That's coming down the pipe and we've been working on a lot of the logistics of how we're gonna move and what that's gonna be. We currently have a tentative date of August 6th to move into that new building, which we're very excited about. And then another fun opportunity is that we're putting together a resident volunteer patrol program. And that's something that the chief is spearheading. What that's going to be is people could join this group and it's gonna be through the police department and they'll be given some training, they'll be given some vests and then they will actually walk around the town of Atherton to help us increase patrol and increase visual presence and then call us as soon as anything is noticed that's out of place or doesn't seem right so the officers can go out and investigate that. And then I know I've been talking for a while, I apologize for that. But the last thing is uh, we recently hired a new Sergeant. His name is Sergeant Fong and he came to us through Stanford Department of Public Safety He's got a wealth of knowledge and experience, and he has actually volunteered to be our new emergency services coordinator. So I think coming out in the future, hopefully at the next meeting, I could get him out to some of these future meetings because he's going to start to be the liaison between ADAP and the police department, along with Chief and myself, because we're more than happy to help out. And that is all I have. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Commander Larson. Um, it's interesting because my uncle was part of a... Um, a <laughs> Uh, Grants Pass, Washington um, resident patrol. Um, uh, they had a very, they had a very robust group of people that, um, you know, started at four o'clock in the afternoon and went till you know literally eight a.m. in the morning, and uh, <laughs> as well as the as well as the regular hours. And it was because obviously the police department wasn't very big, it it kept the crime down very very uh, substantially because they were out there in cars and in their vests. So it was amazing. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, one of the great things about Atherton is we see so many people out and about walking around and they could continue to do that and hopefully just wear one of our vests. <laughs> and that ties perfectly in with the police academy training that you're going to be doing on October 30th. Yes, yes. And that's going to be our Citizens Academy, I believe, uh, signups. I'm not sure when those are going to start. It should be coming up if they haven't started already. And that's going to be an all day event. And if that's something anyone's interested in, try to apply for it early because it, it will fill up and we can only have so many spots. Right. And it's worth every second. <laughs> Thank you. It really is. That's great. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Oh, uh, you're very morning. welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. You're most welcome. It's it having uh, an active police department, uh, working with ADAPT and having the chief and you and this, uh, Sergeant Fong um, participating as at a, such a high level with us gives us not only the validity, but it builds the confidence in our community that this truly is a joint effort between the town and the citizenry. So thank you. Oh, you're Albert. very welcome. Couple of notes before we get started. Um, we did the wildfire pr preparation uh, presentation last month. Uh, that information is on the website. Uh, I have since done additional research um, and found out that the Bear Gulch Reservoir, which is our, our would be our primary backup in a disaster, finally found the data by calling Cal Water, is at 77% uh, capacity. Uh, Hetch Hetchy is at 77% capacity, the entire system. So that information I did not have at the last presentation. Um, one of the problems that we will have in the fire uh, season is that uh, six now of the seven reservoirs in Northern California are below 50% and the average is 41% uh, capacity for those six. And because they're so lo low, they're not going to be able to use the scoop aircraft where an aircraft comes in low, scoops across the water, gathers the water, comes back up and goes and distributes that water to the um, scene of the fire. So um, Cal Fire has purchased 28 uh, Comanche helicopters from, uh, you know, uh, recycled from the military and they're going to um, fit them with the um, 150 gallon buckets um, because planes will not be able to go in and scoop water. So they're going to have to go in and drop the bucket into these uh, low-lying uh, 
reservoirs to get the water for firefighting. So the most important thing is know your evacuation route, practice your evacuation route, especially those of you who live west of Alameda de los Pulgas, if you have uh, lar larger animals like goats or uh, llamas or you know horses or whatever, and practice that, and then do the best you can to keep your property as clear as you can from uh, foliage and uh, and overgrowth. Uh, on with regards to the fire escape kits, we have 28 orders already. We have ordered 15. Um, they got in a shipment of over 2000 and they were just snapped up just like that throughout the country. I did talk to the, uh, uh, one of the principals of the company yesterday and we are in line for the next 35. So we will have a total of 50 units of which we have already 28 folks who um, have signed up for units. As soon as we get the units in, they will be delivered over to uh, one, um, to the administration buildings over at 150 Watkins, uh, Holbrook Palmer Park, and I will set up some dates and times where people can come by. Um, we're getting them at a 20% discount, no tax and no shipping. So they're uh, normally $49.99 and we're getting them for $39.99 and we're asking for $40 just to make it simple. Um, and they have a, 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 a mat, a, a ma uh, not a mask, they have a, a hood that gives you breathable air for 60 minutes fire protection gloves, a fire protection blanket, and a, a nightstick. And then we're asking uh, folks and recommending to folks to add a boost oxygen bottle to it, a bottle of water, and a canister of um, cool fire, which you can get on Amazon. And that's all on our website. So we'll keep you posted when the um, uh, kits come in. We have a current list of the 28 people or the number of people who've got 28 orders. If you wish to order a fire escape kit, Rebecca, what's the best way for them to contact us? Do you want them to con, what's the conduit? Yeah, there's a, I just put a link in the chat if you wanna see what the product looks like and what um, the accessories that Tom was talking about would go with it. Um, that's the, the link to ADAPT vetted supplies. And that has instructions or actually just Tom's email address to contact Tom if you're interested. So just let him know how many you would like. What, what I think a lot of folks do is they order one to go underneath each person's uh, part of the bed. So if you have two kids and two adults, I, in my family, we got four units and we put one under each person so that when they're sleeping, there's one underneath them. So just let Tom know the quantity. Fantastic. Good. And then what you do in, a, in, a, in an evacuation scenario, you would grab that kit and if you need it to get out of the house, you can deploy it or you would deploy it as you're evacuating through a fire scenario, um, a canopy fire in Atherton. Um, on July 24th is the uh, um, Menlo Park, um, the MPC ready presentation. Um, Lynn, what is the topic for the, um, your July presentation? Thank you, Tom. It's going to be on risk reduction insurance. And we'll be hearing as well as what we can do to um, reduce premiums, not, not just what's available, but how to reduce premiums through home hardening, et cetera, what to do if you need to file a claim, keeping it updated. And we'll have an interactive discussion and so forth. That's the gist of it. Thank you, Lynn. So. Uh, MPC Ready is our um, colleague in this um, citizen disaster response effort. Um, so MPC Ready is the ADAPT organization in Menlo Park um, and the surrounding unincorporated areas. And we partner with them to make sure we share resources and let people know about the fantastic work that Lynn and her team is doing in keeping Menlo Park prepared. Our advanced AC training is July 20th and 22nd this month. And what it is, it's going to be neighborhood first aid again, except on a much more detailed level for uh, the area leadership. Um, so this is for AC training, but you're certainly welcome to join us. Just let Rebecca know if you wanna join us. So this is a high level overview uh, on how to organize a neighborhood first aid response. 
The AC training is a little bit more detailed because it's geared for the leadership, um, the area coordinators, the neighborhood and the block coordinators, but you're certainly welcome to join us. So please do so. Um, our drill is still being uh, fleshed out. We currently have 56 signups already in July for the drill. Um, it will be at Homer Palmer Park when we, we finish finalizing it. Um, it will go from eight o'clock to 1 p.m. There'll be uh, breakfast snacks in the morning and pizza at the, uh, at the end provided by local merchants. Uh, and it's gonna be a full day of practicing all of your emergency response skills from organization, communications, reconnaissance, first aid, triage, transport, light search and rescue. We're gonna have a mass casualty event, which we hope will also have a fire element to it. So we'll have to do fire suppression. And it's a great day to, in a safe, comfortable environment where you can make mistakes, um, we're gonna practice and just hone our skills because it's been almost a year and a half since our last drill in September, 2019, excuse me. Um, and that was such a great success because we had 131 participants. So we're looking to duplicate that again. We have received communication from Burlingame CERT, Daily City CERT, Palo Alto CERT already saying that um, they're looking to send folks and we're hoping to have some communication from Coastside CERT as well. Uh, on October 12th and 14th will be the two Zoom sessions for the first aid class that the town of Atherton is sponsoring. It's a free class. It costs about $175 if you were to take it uh, standalone, but the town of Atherton is offering it to adapters. So we're offering it to adapters 94027 first, and then eight, and if there's room, then adapters who are non 94027. If you are a non 94027 adapter, sign up anyway, so that you're on the waiting list. And if, if we do not fill it up with ADAP community members, then you would be first in line. And the chief has already promised that if we have enough um, overflow, if we have, you know, then he will schedule a second class. And this is a tremendous opportunity um, because you're going to be learning first aid skills for disasters. And then your skills practice will be on live victims so that you have that that muscle memory and that experiential memory. So when the real disaster happens, you'll know what to do. On the 16th will be an all day class. So we're making, we're offering it in two formats, two Zoom sessions, probably at six o'clock at night on the 12th and 14th. And then on the 16th, it's an all day Saturday event, lunch included. So the city will be providing lunch. Um, and then on the 23rd, there will be uh, incremental, uh, then we will do the skills check and you'll have a slot in which you come in, you'll go through five stations, you'll be, um, you'll get to practice your skill sets, you'll be mentored, at the conclusion of which then we will, you will receive a first aid certification that is good for three years. So we're really excited about that. Because that fits very nicely into the topic we're going to talk to uh, and about today. And last but not least, the Police Academy on October 31st. Oh, by the way, the first aid class has 24 openings. So sign up early. Um, and um, I'm recommending if you have even young adults in your family, let's say 16 and above, um, I would get them involved as well. Uh, the Police Academy, October 30th, there are 24 openings. Um, this ties in with the the, the announcement today from uh, Commander Dan Larson that they're going to create a citizen patrol. And as I mentioned, um, my uncle, uh, who was at the time was, you know, 68, uh, was part of a similar patrol effort in Grants Pass, uh, um, Washington. And um, it was quite successful. And they had a robust organization uh, walking around and driving around the community to be an adjunct to the police department. Um, I've talked to a number of folks who, who took the Citizens Academy um, the last time it was offered and everyone came back with great reviews. Um, so uh, Commander Larson and Steve McCauley, our chief, do a wonderful job. And that's all of the announcements. Does anyone else have an announcement uh, for the good of ADAPT? Unmute yourself and make the announcement, please.
Okie doke. So today's topic is neighborhood first aid. Last month, we talked about the five most common disaster related first aid issues. And Dr. Barbara Kostick, who I see has joined us today, um, gave a fantastic presentation to um, both the community and both of our uh, advanced training groups on how to deal with that, both on a family, you know, personal level than on a family level. And today, what happens next when you have a whole group of folks? To give some background, ADAPT is composed of individuals who are interested in what ADAPT does. In other words, they're not necessarily ADAPTers, but they come in, they listen to the presentations, they become familiar with it. They're not really ready to become active participants, but they're getting the flavor. They're gradually you know, becoming aware of what's going on in the disaster community. Then we have individuals like yourselves who are active ADAPTers who attend our meetings, who may be area neighborhood or block coordinators, participate in the drills, um, organize, do block parties, whatever. Then we have adapters who host an EAP, which is an emergency assembly point, which is provided by the city, excuse me, the town. And these are locations where people can know to go to gather and get organized. An EAP is usually in front, not always, we have a couple of exceptions, usually in front of an, at the house of an area coordinator. So that it makes total sense. The area coordinator would, would have an EAP in front of their house and then people would gather and then be able to deploy for uh, a disaster response. If an EAP has a DRC trailer, which is a disaster response cash trailer as part of its organization. And um, we, we have two, um, two citizens who have uh, DRCs at their EAPs. Um, then that EAP becomes an ICP. In other words, it moves to one level up, which is an incident, incident command post. Because that trailer has robust medical capability in terms of first aid. It's certainly, we're not, we're not saying that we are a medical facility, but it has a higher level of, of first aid capability and hopefully maybe an attached um, EMT or doctor or nurse or someone who's a certified first aider that can participate in that. And we have, we will have four of them. We have, right now we're moving one of them and uh, and then we have one that is already deployed in um, Atherton East. We have one that we're reassigning in Atherton C uh, Central, excuse me, yeah, in, um, in Atherton West. Atherton Central is waiting to be deployed back to the police department as soon as the uh, um, renovation or the building and construction of the new uh, civic center is completed. And we have gotten approval for a new trailer for Atherton Far West, which is on the other side of Alameda de los Polgas. Um, so the way we're organized is you take care of yourself and your family unit, then you move up to your EAP. If the EAP has a trailer, then it becomes an ICP, which in case for, for medical purposes, people then can transport individuals to that ICP because we have a a more robust first aid capability. The transport from that point of those first aiders um, and the first aid patients is all dependent on professional resources from that point on. Our community meetings and our advanced training then are designed to educate Atherton residents to operate as individuals, as a family, at your EAP or your ICP. And then the drill then all the training we've been doing has been sequential, as you've noticed, as Rebecca's pointed out, moves us forward to where we, in September we do a drill and we take all the training we've done in the previous eight months at our community meetings. We bring it together for one um, big movie, you know, live movie where we go out and spontaneously practice our skills. We organize, we create 
data communications net. We do reconnaissance, we do triage and transport, we do first aid, light search and rescue, we do a mass casualty, and we learn how to actually operate in a disaster scenario. So the sequence for you as a leader, and all of you are leaders, uh, if you're in this meeting, is that you're taking care of yourself first, you're observing your surroundings, you're orienting yourself, you're deciding what to do and you're acting. You're checking on your health, you organize an ex um, action plan, you communicate with your, each other, primarily your family, you check your neighborhood surroundings and you begin the process of remaining safe in a disaster situation. When you get to your EAP slash ICP, depending on um, its construct, again, you're checking in, you're organizing your action plan, you're beginning scribing right away because scribe is very important. You're creating a local communications network, you're checking um, your immediate surroundings with your econ teams, you're providing first aid through triage and transport in a, a first aid unit, which is what we're going to be talking to you about today. And then you are doing light search and rescue as needed. And then you're setting up whatever sheltering scheme that makes sense for your neighborhood. And you're doing it um, for the duration of the event. I wanna thank Lynn Bramlett um, uh, for the information that evidently FEMA so thank you very much, Lynn, for the update. That was very, that was very critical. Um, has now started, it used to be, remember it was three days and then it was seven days. Well, FEMA and a number of other states are now communicating that it's two weeks. So um, we're, we're for right now, we're going to say be prepared to be able to operate independently of professional responders for at least seven days. But just be aware that out there in the world, FEMA and a number of the states are telling their community emergency responders that it is in fact going to be two weeks. Any questions up till now? And I, I'll open it up for a couple of seconds for any questions that you have. Okay, so this is the plan. Um, these, uh, this outline that we have, which is a checkbox outline, we have a we have a uh, slides here that you have available, but we also have a checklist that goes uh, to into the notebook that we've given every area and block coordinator. So this is the medical checklist, so that you could literally, as a IC, an incident commander at your EAP actually hand this to someone that is relatively, may not even be an adapter, but rel relatively good at organization. And if they were to follow this checkbox, set of checkboxes, they could in fact put together for you a neighborhood medical response operation. So the incident con commander takes care of him or herself first, obviously. They take care of their family second. And then after their family is secure, now that means the family can come with them to the ICP or EAP, or, or that might already be there, or they stay at home. And then they organize their emergency assembly point with a scribe, very important. I know it sounds uh, maybe um, not um, glamorous, but having a scribe at the very beginning is very critical because it'll be that scribe that keeps you the IC or you the team leaders um, focused. And then when professional responders do show up, they will have the information that you can give a very succinct uh, situation report known as the sit rep to either the fire department or the police department as they come by. You, if you have a, if you have a cache in your neighborhood, you start to deploy it and set up a, a logistics person who starts opening the cache. If you have um, a DRC trailer, disaster response, you set up a logistics person to begin to deploy that. You immediately set up an EAP communications unit 
at your ICP or EAP. If you're doing your, if you're doing a communications unit at your EAP, the local one, you're making sure that you have a ham radio so that you can then communicate up to an ICP, of which we have four, East Atherton, Central, East Atherton, Central, West, and Far West. So that communication can go up to the ICPs and that goes up to the town EOC so that uh, Chief McCulley and the fire district, if, if resources are available, can then bring help to you if necessary. As I said, you're setting up your logistics unit, you're setting up your operations unit. Now operations is in charge of sending out that first reconnaissance team so you know what's going on in the neighborhood before you deploy anybody. You're setting up um, the eyes and ears so that when you bring that information back, then the medical team, which is being set up as the recon team is going out, can know how to send your triage transport teams in the field. When you set up a neighborhood first aid station and medical operations, you, this, you assign an area in your, on your, in your neighborhood to where you're going to do that. You staff the area with as many people as have knowledge. You may or may not have a doctor, but maybe you have a, a, somebody like me who's a retired EMT, or you may have somebody who's just taken our first aid class and is you know, a, a certified first aider because that's may, maybe all you have. But you set up a staff area. You set up a intake triage area with colored tarps or signage. Now, in the drill, you'll see that we, at our, in our medical operations area, we'll have uh, four kinds of tarps, red, yellow, green, and black. We will also have blue as well, and we'll explain that in a moment. Those are where, when you send out your triage teams and transport teams into the field based on the information that your reconnaissance teams have given you, you're bringing them back for assessment at your first aid station. Red is for immediate, yellow is for delayed, green is walking wounded and still need attention, black is for uh, a morgue and you make sure that that's separate from the medical area for psychological reasons and you make sure you have that um, staff for care and compassion of our residents who have deceased. And we've created a blue tarp, which is not, a, is not part of the FEMA scheme because in a disaster, if it's going to be seven days, yellow is going to become red and red will become black. Now that's kind of a, kind of a cold and harsh way to look at it, but it is reality. And if we're not going to be able to transport people for seven days, we have to have a place, in my opinion, which is why we, we at ADAP created a blue tarp, to compassionately care for those we know are, are dying and there's nothing we can do for them, but we want to care for them. So we have a blue tarp and the blue tarp is in, in and about the area where the black tarp is. You have a treatment area so that as soon as you find out, you assess folks as they're coming back in because we have sent out medical teams, triage transport teams to do a quick triage in the field, quick treatment in the field, they bring them back, they get triaged again, then we put them into our uh, treatment area. Then you create a recovery area to where you, now you're taking care of folks. And then the blue tarp, which is your terminal injury area. And then your black tarp, which is your morgue. And those are the sections of a medical unit. So you might ask, well, Tom, what happens if we only got three people? And that's all we can do for uh, uh, our neighborhood. Then you scale back to whatever you can do. So in a neighborhood, you might have only be able to send out one team at a time, send out your recon team, they come back, they get reconstituted and go right back out and do triage transport. And they come back and then they're going back out. And maybe you only have three total people, in which case, whoever is going to be the medical team leader, and you pick one, the one who has the most medical experience, then you figure out how to combine the various groupings. So for example, you might end up having your intake and treatment area be combined if you don't have enough people. 
and your recovery area and terminal injury area together, the morgue will always be separate. Um, but you're going to have to adapt, excuse the pun. Your ability to run a first aid station is obviously dependent upon how many folks you have. And but once you have the construct, you understand how a fully developed first aid station looks like, a staff area, an intake area, treatment, recovery, terminal injury, and more, then you can adjust it. And you adjust it based upon the design and the needs of your neighborhood. So as Rebecca re talked about earlier this morning, we have a plan that we are using town-wide. In other words, this is part of the manual for all of our area block and neighborhood coordinators so that when we work with each other area to area or professional responders show up, they know that all of us are doing the same thing in the um, same time and in the same manner, and it makes it easier for them. Before you open a medical unit, you should have a minimum of three people. Does anyone want to know why it is we want three folks? Anyone want to venture a guess? For safety and fatigue relief. Three people is, is the minimum that we are using in ADAPT rather than two, because with three, you have safety and security and you have the ability to make sure that you're able to do what you can do. Below three, um, your, whatever you're executing becomes problematic. So you really do want to have three folks. And you can see there in that picture, we do have, um, those are members of the uh, ADAP medical team, which is, consists of Paul, right now, Paul Jamilian, uh, Barbara Kostick, um, Susan and uh, Richard Lawrence. And we are looking for other individuals who are EMTs and nurses and doctors, or those of you who get certified in October to join that medical team uh, so that you can independently under the leadership of Dr. Paul Jamilian and Dr. Barbara Kostick do your own training. And we're looking forward to doing that. Medical you're gonna want us. Yes, you're please. Gonna want us. You're going to want a scribe in there too, someplace. Yeah, I'm about I'm about to talk about that. Yes, thank oh, you. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's perfect because you're you know you're right along with it. So the the unit is led by a supervisor with a scribe who also will double as the radio operator. So you'll say, well, why do you have so many scribes? Because we have a scribe assigned to the IC. We have a scribe assigned to communications, as we've talked about, and we have a scribe in medical. And the reason why you do that in the fog of, of, of war, so to speak, or the chaos of a disaster, the more you have people writing things down, when things get really confused, the IC or the plans person can stop everything. You can compare notes and then get, get yourself refocused. That actually happened in the Menlo Park drill where we lost a team in the field that nobody knew. So we stopped everything. The, the IC scribe and the communication scribe got together as did the uh, medical scribe. They compared the notes. We found out where the team was and then found out that the radio had gone dead and had to send out another team to retrieve them. But having scribes and having literally, and you, you say, well, what about resources? And I say, yes, and then you'll have to adapt. Um, you have to have a, a scribe for sure with the IC, but you definitely want to scribe with your communications and with your medical, if you can. You do the best you can. Tom, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to give you a heads up. It's 945, so half an hour left for the presentation. Yes, thank you. I will be able to get through it. Um, now, the scribe is, you know, taking care of, is recording the information as it's coming in. It records unit activity. It's communicating um, with in the medical unit and to the IC. So um, that person has uh, a dual role and is keeping track of what's going on. Now, in terms of the radio traffic, most of the time they're going to be um, listening in on the communication between the, the field teams and whatever. 
but they're also uh, have the ability to communicate with the teams in the field. You have your intake area, which is made up of a coordinator and any volunteers you can get. It has a red tarp, a yellow tarp, um, and a green tarp. Or if you don't have a tarp, because you know, frankly, they're expensive, then you just get a uh, construction paper, red, yellow, green, um, and you just tack it up on the canopy or whatever you have that is designated as your area. Maybe it's even on the ground. So if you don't have tarps, then you just get construction paper and use that. You're engaged in patient tracking documentation begins as soon as they come into the intake area. And we have forms for that. And that form follows the patient wherever they go. We have a treatment area coordinator with volunteer assistance. They're continuing to maintain the tracking documentation and they are assigning people to the red, yellow, and green areas for treatment. So the, for the red area, they get treated first, the yellow area gets treated second, the green area gets treated third. And again, you treat at the level you are trained at. If you only have first aiders, you only have four people who are trained uh, in the October class or by Red Cross, that's the level of train, that's the level of first aid you give and you understand your, that's the best you can do. And you do that with full confidence and understanding of the consequences of let's say a seven day event. After you've done whatever treatment you think you're going to be able to do immediately, then they go to the recovery area with volunteers and there's a recovery area coordinator and that individual and those are constantly watching and monitoring the folks after they've been treated to, to see if the injury stabilizes or the injury gets worse. If the injury gets worse, they go back to treatment. They try to, mit, uh, to remediate that situation and they go back into recovery. Understanding that if we're gonna be out there for seven days and we are not gonna be able to transport people to a medical facility, or for whatever reason, you can't get them to an ICP where we have a trailer with uh, more robust medical uh, gear, then you understand that over time, injuries will degrade and conditions will de degrade. And you have to build your emotional muscle and your intellectual muscle to understand that and be strong enough to watch that scenario because an individual, as you know, in disaster scenarios, yellow become red and red become black, or they become blue and then black. And that's a, that's a mindset, that's disaster psychology. And once you know that, that gives you the, the courage and, and the calm to know that you can only do what you can do. And if an individual goes from yellow to red, and then unfortunately is deceased, that you are comforted in that you did the best you can within the range of skills that you have. Um, and understand if it were out there for seven days, that's quite likely. In the recovery area, obviously you're continuing your tracking documentation um, and you're constantly monitoring the people that are in that area. And as I said, uh, know that yellow will become red and red will become black or actually become blue and then black and that you um, are aware of that. The blue tarp um, is terminal injury. You have a coordinator with, with, at least a coordinator with some volunteer assistance. You're still tracking documentation and you're doing compassionate comfort care as best as possible for those who are dying when transport to an official medical care unit is not available. And that's the key, having the strength enough to provide that compassionate care uh, to assist that individual. The black tarp, which is for deceased as a coordinator and probably only two volunteer assistants, maybe only one. They, they make sure that the tracking documentation is up to date. And more importantly, that they begin to fill out pa uh, patient essential information, which will include religious belief and personal contacts. And the reason why you want to know religious beliefs is that in a number of religions, 
um, and to know this, is that um, the processing of someone who's gone to their God uh, must take place within three days. And you want to know that, not that you might be, not that you would be able to comply with that religious belief, but to know that there are folks for whom a, there is a three-day cycle between um, the moment of death and being um, attended to by the religious leader. And then you make sure that you have respectful and secure care for our deceased neighborhoods, uh, excuse me, our neighbors. You want to make sure that the area is secure, it's compassionate in terms of the care and respectful. These are our neighbors, these are our maybe even family members, so you want to make sure that that's secure. When you send out your teams initially, after the recon teams come in and they start telling you what's going on, you're sending out your uh, triage teams to do um, the triage in the field. Very quick, and I do mean very quick, stabilizing treatment, and then transporting your neighbors back to the EAP. Teams should would be wearing helmets, have surgical gloves under their work gloves, I would have a set of goggles, definitely a headlamp, some minimal tools, a stretcher, and some first aid supplies, and an FRS radio. Because teams are made up of six folks, and those six folks are a team leader, a radio operator, two medical assistants, and three support individuals for a total of six. And are your medical teams should always be six. I say should the ideal situation, because it takes six people effectively to stretcher somebody back so that uh, no one of the, re the recovery team gets injured. So we have, we have established that six is in fact what we'd like. We're also recommending that you, those of you who have EAPs, um, our ICPs have fixed um, pole litters and, and um, stretchers uh, we found out that the canvas stretchers, the rollout canvas stretchers are not good because the individual in the middle, the two individuals in the middle end up carrying the bulk of the weight and you cause back injuries for the two individuals in the middle of that six person group. So we want fixed pole stretchers so that we evenly distribute the weight. The Individuals who are not um, yellow or red walk with you, in other words, the walking wounded, as you gather them up with you back to the uh, IC, uh, to your EAP. Any questions up till now, please? We had a couple of questions in the chat, Tom. One was, um, do you have any recommendations of where to get those pole stretchers? Yes, um, the recommendation will, um, you can get them on Amazon and shop around to get the best deal. And when you do that, for those of you who are, are setting up your EAPs, talk to the vendor and explain to them that you are part of the Atherton Police Department. And if you need a reference letter from me, I can give that to you or a reference letter from Chief McCauley, he can give it to you because there's an automatic 10% discount for police and fire associations for most of these uh, medical equipment vendors. Uh, that's why we're able to get the 20% discount for our fire escape kits. I was able to no negotiate an additional 10% because of the bulk order on top of the 10% we got for being part of the uh, police department. Um, so that is the best, um, best resource. If I come up with a um, a better resource or a, that is really economical for all of us. And we'll make sure that it's on the website in our um, resource um, section of the website. The other question? In chat? Yeah, there was one more about um, team members. Um, how do we make a decision if there aren't three people? If we see someone that is bleeding and needs attention, are we okay to go in and help that person if it's just us alone? Yes. And which means that all of us should be carrying in a disaster, um, a little, a little a medical fanny pack, okay? 
So not only do you, like, for example, I have a 15 person, a medical kit in my car as part of, part of my um, cert go bag. And I also have a, um, a US military um, M117 field um, medical kit for, for combat. But I, I wanna make sure that I, if I come across somebody and I'm by myself, I can give them at least stabilizing, do triage and some stabilizing uh, treatment, call it in um, or wait with the person and let the triage transport teams, yes. Um, however, in our organization, it's okay to do that, and, but it, you have to make sure you're communicating that you've got this individual out there so we don't duplicate what's happening with our triage transport teams. And because of the duplication, we leave that individual by themselves because it, we perceive that they've been taken care of when in fact they haven't. So you wanna keep the chain of command going, the order of process going, so that your triage transport teams are taking care of people and bringing them back. But that certainly doesn't prevent you from um, working with individuals. Now in this, I guess gets to, thank you for that question because let's say you treat somebody and you're by yourself and you help them back. However you do that, you manage to get them back. So the, your medical unit has to be ready to accept individuals who are injured who are not being brought in by transport teams, but are being brought in by neighbors one-on-one. -on -one. So whoever is the leader and who's ever the intake person, you're gonna have two influxes of patients. One from just people bringing in their injured, maybe family members, and then those who are coming in from triage transport teams. So be prepared for that. Um, and those of you who do treat someone on your own, it's important to make a clear decision where you're gonna stay with that person or you're not. And if you're not, try to get someone else to stay with them. So then you can either by radio or by foot traffic, you can report it to the unit so they can send out a team to take care of that individual. You perform extended medical um, treatment as you are able or as long as you are able. And that's the key understand that we're, you know, unless you have a doctor or an ENT as part of your neighborhood organization, you're going to do what you have been trained to do. And hopefully as many of you can take that first aid class in October or a Red Cross first aid class, um, or you remember some of what Dr. Kostic shared with you before, so that you know how to, on a basic level, treat individuals to give them a better chance of surviving a disaster. But understand, you're gonna give the best care you know how. And it might not save that individual and understand that too, because we're gonna be out there for seven days. And once you have that psychology, then you are really free to give what you can to that injured individual in total confidence and certainty. Eventually, if things work out, we get an ICP set up, of which there be four, as I said, east, central, west, and far west. And then through communication from your, your, um, your, your little communications unit at your EAP via ham radio, you're talking to an ICP and the ICP says, we're ready to take people in uh, for extended medical care. Then you can transport them and it's gonna be by foot most likely, or maybe by vehicle. And you send them over to the ICP where we have, we'll have a, hopefully have a doctor and an EMT and, and more robust um, communicate, uh, more robust um, medical capability. Now the components of a medical EAP uh, includes medical supplies, Medication monitoring, which would be allergies, antidepressants, diabetes, heart, and other conditions. Psychological response, being aware of what's going on psychologically with your team and the people around you. Proper documentation, FRS radios, because that's going to be your primary level of communication. And hopefully a ham radio so that you can communicate 
communicate upward, and then tra transport and triage supplies. So the transport triage supplies would be a stretcher, triage kits, you can put them in bags, you can create actually, you know, um, Ziploc bags that have, have uh, various kinds of wraps and four by fours and, and whatnot. Um, you, at the, at obviously at the unit you will have, you would have hopefully have cardboard is the best way, um, just cut up cardboard, uh, makes wonderful splints. Um, the key is to have lots and lots and lots of four by fours and eight by eights and four by sixes, the larger style of bandages and the ability to wrap them up. Very, very important. In your documentation kit, you're gonna have a, a medical field team. It's called a document 214. You'll have an activity log. You'll have patient accounting. We have also had, we have a male patient assessment and a female patient assessment, which is basically a male female uh, silhouette. You want blank paper so you can improvise if you don't have forms. You want an EAP layout in advance so that you, everybody knows how to lay out an EAP for the entire group. And you want pens, pencils, and notepads. If you have pencils, make sure you have pencil sharpeners. I prefer pencils because um, over time, pens dry out. Uh, they're subject to hot and cold where uh, pens, uh, pencils are not. But if you're going to have pencils, you want pencil sharpeners. Any questions about supplies, by the way? I mean, excuse me about documentation. OK, so supplies. We talked about stretchers. But what are you going to need to have a unit? Well, minimally, I think you should have a tarp excuse me, a, um, a canopy, a place where people know to go to. You, you have a white piece of paper, you write on there medical unit, okay, or first aid station or however you wish to design it. You have triage tarps or signage. Now, as I said, triage tarps are expensive, uh, but construction paper is not. You go to Michael's and you get red, yellow, green, blue, and black, and you can put those up and you have a place where you can have intake. You can even duplicate it for your recover, uh, for your uh, treatment area. And then obviously you have recovery. You want triage tape. You can get that on at Amazon, very, very cheap. It's just tape. You want red, yellow, um, green, blue, and black. And you just wrap it around the person's arm. When you're getting out in the field, when you're doing a triage, you're, you're putting that tape on them and that tape follows them. So they come in as yellow. And then as their status changes, you may put another tape on them that's yellow and red that tells them that it's, it's moved, that kind of thing, or green to yellow. We, we came up with, and I wanna thank Susan Warren and Paul Jamillion for this one. This was their brilliant creation in the Menlo Park drill of all things. We created a clothesline with clothespins and we hooked it up and we put all of our forms on these clothes and then we, we were moving them down so we could keep track of people as, as they came in and they moved through the process through you know, intake treatment and recovery and we're able to move them down and we had quick reference to absolutely every patient that came in. So I thought that was just a brilliant idea. You want marking pens, um, again, green, yellow, red, blue and black. I'm recommending headlamps over flashlights because you're gonna be doing medical operations at night. So you want headlamps. You want stretchers, again, stretchers cost. So, you know, figure out how many stretchers you want. One or two would be more, you know, be typical for a neighborhood. The whole neighborhood would have to go in on it, I'm sure. And it would be, and you want the, one, you want the uh, stretchers that collapse. So even though it's a fixed pole stretcher, it, it collapses in two, for storage purposes, and then it has a locking position. So I recommend that that style of uh, stretcher. Uh, again, if you can have two canopies, fine. If you can't, then it's one canopy. You want a tent if possible, and that tent can have multiple uses. It could be for um, the folks in recovery, so it's a form of protection, in which case you probably want a eight-person tent, which holds four people or six people in a um, medical situation. 
or is a staff area recovery area, but that's entirely up to you. You'll probably want a, you know, a card table with two chairs so that you can do your administration. You want FRS radios for your medical, because remember the medical unit sends out the triage transport teams. So even though they're under operations, they have complete control of the entire process so that they can maintain, you can maintain that continuity of healthcare. Um, so you want FRS radios, um, obviously a minimum of two, hopefully four. You want a ham radio so that the EAP can call up to the ICP or call directly to the town of Atherton EOC. Uh, as I said, I recommend a 15 person uh, uh, first aid kit. I get mine from Simpler Life down south. I have a surgical kit. And the reason why I have a surgical kit is because I did take disaster surgery at Ohio State a while back. But it has the kind of tools I would need to be able to do some, uh, some uh, better uh, care. We're recommending that you have boost oxygen, quick clot. So boost oxygen, as you know, is the oxygen uh, supplement. Um, you can get them at uh, Pharmaca online and Swanson Health online. Um, you wait till they go on sale. Quick clot, uh, very, very important. It allows you to stop bleeding. Um, and uh, so I have you know, about six of those in my medical kit. And then I have additional water for medical, not for hydration for me and the staff or me and my fellow neighbors, but literally for medical purposes. And so I, I created a little six pack out of the Costco water case. I just created a little six pack and I marked it medical. Extra gloves and extra masks, critical figure, um, three pairs of gloves per day and a mask per day. So if you're gonna be seven days, then seven times three would be a minimum of 21 and seven times one is seven. So seven masks and 21 pairs of gloves or more. Extra bandages, uh, preferably four by four, six by four, even eight by eight, because you can fold them over and wrapping tape. Uh, Dr. Barbara, are you on, on still here? Yep, I'm here. What's the name of that wrapping tape you keep telling us about? Oh, well, one is Curlex. That's, okay. that's the one, that's the bulky one you put over. I think you're gonna need more gloves than just three a day though. Okay, then the, then. Because what, our, you know, we have to change gloves between patients. Okay, so what would be your recommendation? So, okay, if it's- well, I would if it, 10 a day per person. Oh, say again? 10. Okay, there you go. Anytime you go to the bathroom, anytime, you know, it, it's just, we, we go through gloves like water. That's, okay. that's why I kind of like just the, you know, the vinyl ones that are easy to put on and take off. Mm -hmm. Perfect, I'm thank sure, you. Unless you're allergic to that stuff, rather than the ones that are, are form fitting. Okay, very good. Um, ha you know, when you get your Amazon shipments, Cut up your Amazon boxes and into various lengths and sizes for splinting. Cardboard is the easiest and inexpensive, mostly free because it comes with your Amazon box and you don't have to spend a lot of money on uh, splinting. I could make a suggestion for that too. You know, look at your forearm because there's going to be a lot of wrist injuries. So you'll need to have one from the elbow down to about mid hand, somewhere that length would be really nice to wrap around your arm. And they can be, they don't have to be that wide, but they have to be that long. Okay, very and good. You wrap them, you'll have one on the front and one on the back. Like we call them sugar tongs. Yeah. Remember? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then okay. for the ankle, you're gonna need one that will, stable, that will stabilize the injury, not just at the injury. So no squares, we don't need any squares. We need long rectangles. Yes, long rectangles. Thank you, Barbara. Um, you, you're gonna want emergency blankets and ponchos. Well, emergency blankets and ponchos for your staff, for your, your team members, but also for the people who are recovering so that you can keep them out of, keep them warm and hopefully partially covered if there's inclement weather especially if you don't have a canopy for them. So you wanna be able to do that. Um, then you want food and water resources for your staff and food and water resources for the injured. 
So these are the things that an area coordinator, a block coordinator, a neighborhood coordinator are thinking about. You're gathering your neighbors together and you're talking about to what level you want to staff a medical unit and then you go ahead and des design a staff organization and then a supply capability. Um, you want a central neighborhood cash, however you wish to do that. Some one person may be, now, for example, in one neighborhood, there's, there is a, a, they have a, it's not a DRC, but they have a little trailer that has all their stuff in it. In another neighborhood, one of the individuals has a um, backyard um, shed that has all their uh, first aid stuff in it and people have access to it. In another neighborhood that I know of in Atherton, there are three separate caches, each with a little bit of everything. So in case of one cache gets hit by a tree, it doesn't take it all out. So they have it dispersed mm -hmm. among the neighborhood. So that's a, a that's several ways of doing oh, that. Wow. I'm sorry, say again? Oh, okay. Um, I would have a personal medical cache for your you and your family that whatever you think is appropriate and then add boost oxygen, water, and then add um, quick clock to that. Pre-assign cache materials and contents among neighbors and have a block party so everybody knows where these cache items are and how to get to them in case somebody's on vacation. Try to duplicate resources where possible. Um, and have a backup ability to supplement your first aid station out of your go bag. So we have a bug out bag, which is your, your survival capability. And then you have the CERT go bag. So in my CERT go bag, as I said, I have a, a medical, a 15 person medical kit that's totally separate from my field medical medic kit so that I can supplement. So be thinking about that, how you can create redundancy in your capability. It's very important and remember always think about how are you going to do sustain this for seven days it sounds daunting you're going to have limited resources and if you plan ahead with that mindset how do i sustain a medical unit for seven days let alone the eap and do it with what resources how am i going to organize myself how i'm going to make i take care of my responders how do i give them rest you are going to have a successful medical first aid station and be able to provide the best care possible with the resources you have and hopefully reduce death and you know remediate injury and that's the goal so any questions about how you go about creating a neighborhood medical response and is this helpful? By the way, this check sheet that I have communicated from and we summarized on our slides and the slides will be available is, um, will be in the, on the website. Uh, we've updated the communications um, uh, portion of that checklist and now, and at the end of this meeting, we will update the medical portion of the checklist for area coordinators block and, um, neighborhood coordinators. And I think everyone should have this. It doesn't matter if you're a neighborhood area or block coordinator. What happens if you're, you're part of your, your neighborhood organization, but your area coordinator is not there. They're in, happen to be in Hawaii when the earthquake happens. Everyone needs to be, know how to step in and do the best they possibly can. And with a unified checklist as we have created it, where everyone is doing approximately the same thing, and this has been passed on by um, Barbara Kostick and Paul Jamilian, and they've approved this as our doctors, then we can guarantee that no matter who you are in the Atherton community with this checklist, you can do a pretty good job of taking care of folks. Has this been helpful to those of you in, the, uh, in your organizations as a, a community member or a community leader? Is there any, yep. any, are there any areas where we can improve this presentation? 
Tom, as this is Wally, as usual, excellent. I enjoyed it and it was very helpful. Okay, thank you. The only question that, uh, that I had was, we're talking about you know canopies and tents and stuff like that. If we have buildings that are standing and available, would it be advisable to move into structure if we're talking about really inclement weather, like bad wind, heavy rain, that kind of thing where being out on the ground is just gonna be intolerable? That's an incredibly, <laughs> In, you know, insightful question. So here, this is where the IC and the medical unit core uh, supervisor are going to have to put their heads together and think about this. The first answer would be obviously yes, if you can. It, however, it has a big asterisk or a double asterisk after it. Remember aftershocks. The biggest problem we have in assessment of going back into buildings and using them as shelter after a quake is that we know there are going to be a minimum of three to four aftershocks that will be within one Richter of the original sh uh, shake. Okay, and that that is historically known. And as we've discovered, let's say in the the Ridgecrest quake and a number of the other quakes that uh, I have done after action reports on, you're going to have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten aftershocks that that may be two or three Richters down, but could de destabilize the building. And do you want to be in a building that it initially looked pretty good after a quake, but while you're inside that building, you're having aftershocks? Or would you rather be outdoors under a canopy, hopefully clear of trees and poles? That decision does the medical unit supervisor and the IC are going to have to make the IC being most likely the you know, area coordinator. That's a tough call, but those are the important things you have to assess. Do I, want, do I want to be in a building where there's going to be aftershocks and though the first earthquake and maybe the first af aftershock didn't stay, destabilize the building and I go in there, but the second, third, fourth, fifth aftershock destabilizes, which means then you have to have a, then you have to have a search and rescue to pull all those people out. So, Kurt, that is an incredibly excellent question, and it requires some really thoughtful processing. I personally would keep it outdoors so that I wouldn't have to deal with the search and rescue aspect of a destabilized building. But that's me. You have to make that call. 